Now, I'm not saying the water is the cleanest in the world. This is Amateur Survival. I'm Darren Carden. I'm a novice survivalist going on a two-night simulated survival trip. Today I'm in Freetown State Forest in Freetown, Massachusetts. I'll be testing out survival techniques I've seen on TV and the internet. I'm going to put these techniques to the test and see if a normal person with no experience can use them effectively. There's not much time where I got dropped off at about 6 o'clock at night. The conditions are very poor. It's like a frozen swamp, or, or like a semi-frozen swamp, and that, that makes it really difficult to walk. Honestly, it's like you're just walking through slush. I've got a couple supplies with me. We can talk about that later. I, I gotta get to a, a camp first. I've managed to get myself stuck in a swamp. There's no way out before dark. This is gonna be home for tonight. It's just like a little island about four feet by three feet in the middle of this marsh. It's covered in brambles, but it's the only place I've seen big enough to make camp. I mean, this is gonna be a hard night. One of the supplies I brought with me is a small tarp. In cold weather, having insulation between you and the ground is very important. Usually I put evergreen branches below me, but there's no time for that now. I'm going to use the tarp to protect me from the wet ground. We might have to talk about supplies tomorrow. The one thing we have is a Mylar blanket. I have a sleeping bag, that's for emergencies only. The Mylar blanket was developed by NASA in the 1960s. They reflect up to 97% of heat and weigh less than a pound. The blankets are so effective that they've been used by the Taliban to mask themselves from heat sensors. This makes them ideal for survival situations going to be pretty cold tonight, probably down to 20, so this is going to be tough. <sighs> what a night. That, that was rough. The, the, at first, the idea was I was only going to use this emergency blanket. It, that's one of the s supply items I have. But as a backup, just in case I had the sleeping bag, and I did end up using that. I mean, it was it was brutal. I don't even know if it would have been survivable otherwise. Let's go over the supplies real quick, because I want to head out in a couple minutes. So first, we got the emergency blanket, and and you know right off the bat, I already tested it. I already was able to compare it to the sleeping bag because I used them both last night. This is not a replacement for this. At first, I was thinking. Oh, I got the emergency blanket. That's all I need. That is not all you need. It, it helps. It definitely helps. But, you know, in, in 20 degree weather, you need more. I've got uh, a tin can. I've got some cups. I've got some paper towels in here. Some paper towels. And, of course, I've got my knife. As far as water goes, we, we have some snow here. Um, it's kind of nasty. Um, there might be some other ways to get some liquid. We'll, we'll check that out in a while. It, it was very cold last night, but in some ways that's good because the whole swamp is frozen solid, so I can just walk right off, right, walk right out of it. Also, I've got an empty lighter. No fuel, but if you've seen any of my shows before, you'll know that we've got a secret with this. Freetown State Forest is located in southeastern Massachusetts. It's roughly five square miles and sits in the cities of Fall River and Freetown. The forest contains several large dirt roads that travel the length of the forest. I'll be using these roads when possible. As in most of New England, there are large populations of pine, oak, and maple trees. These trees all offer different sources of food, if you can find them. There's snow everywhere, so I mean, I can drink that, but you gotta eat it and then let it dissolve in your mouth, and it really, 
If you do that enough, it doesn't feel very good, so... If I can melt some snow, it's much easier to drink. There's pine needles everywhere, so if I can start a fire, keeping it going won't be a problem. And we have this lighter. Now there's two parts to it. I, I took it off before without even thinking, but there's a little metal piece right here. I pulled that off, and then there's a little metal uh, kind of strap right here. I took that off too. So now, you take the lighter, you have it looking, you have it just like that, and you take a stick, point here is to use a stick to generate a bigger spark. It can be done with just your thumb, but the stick is much easier. This technique is extremely easy to learn and can be used in most weather conditions. I got the fire going. Now I'm going to melt some snow. The water is all set. This is how you can get the can off. You know, obviously it's boiling hot. You take a stick with kind of a fork in it, and you just wrap it around the can. And that's it. So there's a new segment and it's called Viewer Challenge. So um, a couple months ago, a guy asked me, well not asked me, but told me it was possible to boil water in a paper cup. Now I'd like to test that out. It's not really a challenge because I think he's right. I think you can do it, but it's worth trying. So we've The stone boiling technique is a way to bring water to a boil without having a metal container. It's been practiced by almost all native cultures. Drop hot rocks into it and stone boil it and that's that's what I'm gonna do right now. So we're gonna take the stones. Oops. I'm gonna take the stones. They're, they've been oh they've been heating for maybe uh, 20 minutes and we're just gonna put them in. Boiling is a sure method to kill any kind of virus, but you may not have a fireproof container with you. With stone boiling, almost any type of container will do because the container never comes in direct contact with the fire. Hey, it works just fine. So if you didn't have a tin can and you needed to boil water, or if you didn't have something metal and you needed to boil water, this would, this would work very well. Now, I'm not saying the water is the cleanest in the world, but it, it, it does boil it. Since I got here, one of the things I've been looking for are maple trees. That's because in late winter, early spring, you can actually tap these things and get the sap and drink it, you know, in case you didn't have any liquid. In addition, the sap is stored in the trunk of the tree during the winter and rises in late winter, early spring. Weeks. So it, about mid-February till mid to late March. And from my understanding, that's the only time it's available. Furthermore, it only comes up on days where you have the nights below freezing and the days above freezing. Something has to do with how the tree works, but that's, that's how it works. It's difficult to kind of recognize maple trees. It's not like a pine tree or a birch where you look at it and you know. But I've been looking, I think this is a, a maple tree right here. And now the bark is, it's kind of grayish and f like flat, but as it gets older, the bark kind of gets like ruffles in it. In my opinion, a lot of trees look like that. But what I've been seeing are these things. This it looks like a maple leaf to me. You know, and a maple leaf, if you've ever seen a Canadian flag, that's the maple leaf. And in front of these trees, in front of this tree... Native know, tribes in North America were the first to tap these trees. They passed the knowledge on to the Europeans, which led to the commercialization of the process. 
This specific type is called the sugar maple, and it's very common in New England. I'm going to tap another one. There's a bigger one over there. I'm going to tap that in a second, and um, we'll see what happens. So what I've done is basically just chop a little hole in the bark, you know, nothing to it. We got a string here that's holding a cup in place, and very important is this little piece of paper towel. Now, there's a lot of different ways to collect the sap. Obviously, the different methods exist for obtaining the sap. The modern method involves nailing a spout into the tree. Natives use reeds that funnel the sap into wooden containers. I've personally found that a napkin works very well. Placing the napkin over the hole will absorb the sap. It'll then drip off the napkin into a cup. The napkin, it absorbs the sap, and then, you know, it's going to roll down the towel and it's going to go right into the cup. So I like this way a lot. It, it actually works pretty well. Here it is. So, I mean, in two hours, that's, that's really not that bad for doing nothing. You know, and there's lots of trees out here. It's not like that's the only one. In fact, there's you, you'd have to guess there's thousands of them. And keep in mind... The average maple tree will produce about 13 gallons of sap per season. Let's give it a shot and just make... The production of maple syrup occurs almost exclusively in New England and Canada, with Canada producing 80% of the world's syrup. Yeah, that does taste like it. Now, it doesn't really taste like maple. Uh, it tastes like a... It has almost a, a melon taste, almost. It doesn't taste like maple syrup at all. You've got to boil it down quite a bit before you get that taste. Some people but, have asked know, me if drinking maple sap will dehydrate you. This is not the case. The sugar content of maple sap is between 2 and 5%. Your average can of soda has roughly 10%. In fact, maple sap is actually marketed as a type of sports drink by several Canadian companies. I have absolutely no clue where I am right now. <laughs> I'm on a trail, but I mean there's there's dozens of trails out here. All I know is that if I go northeast, eventually I'll get to Profile Rock. So that's really what I'm doing. This is going to be base camp tonight. It's just some grass on the ground. Oh my god, my head is killing me. I can't walk any more than this. I don't know how far. I could be five minutes from the exit. But, hey, it's not going to happen. You know what? I said I was, uh, oh, I'm only going to use the Mylar blanket. <sighs> yeah, right, dude. Forget about that. I'm using the sleeping bag and the Mylar blanket. I just don't have the, uh, I just don't have what it takes to just do the, uh, the Mylar tonight. Maybe some other time. <laughs> One of the things I forgot to mention earlier is that I have a, a water bottle here. It's empty. Well, it's not empty right now, but it was empty. And uh, one thing you can do if you've got snow on the ground is... Obviously, you can eat the snow by itself, right? I mean, you could do this. But over time, it's going to hurt your mouth. So if you can uh, melt this first, that's the way to go. So what you can do is just take the snow stick it in the water bottle then take this and just put it in your pocket or lay it out in the sun and this will it'll melt the water and melt the snow and then you can you know you've got fresh water to drink all right we're on the move the mylar blanket didn't really get a chance to shine it didn't keep me warm the first night, but if I had more time to set up camp, maybe things would have been different. I'll need to test this out again sometime. Fire with an empty letter is a snap. It takes almost no skill or effort. I think almost anyone could learn to do this. 
stone boiling is a simple technique and will work with almost any container. If it holds water, chances are it can boil water. Identifying maple trees can be tricky, especially in the winter. Anytime you put anything in your mouth, you need to know for sure what it is. I would not recommend this technique without practice. Alright, we've got to a road, <laughs> so that's perfect. <laughs> 